preparations for the last servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope are well underway at several NASA facilities. Almost all 22,000 pounds of Service Mission 4 hardware is at some stage of integration and test at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. This includes new gyros, batteries, fine guidance sensor, astronaut tools, support hardware, a new docking ring, the carrier systems, and two new Hubble science instruments. The Wide Field Camera 3 begins its third and final thermal vacuum test shortly, where it will experience the harshness of space inside a large simulator for several weeks. The service mission for astronauts come to Goddard to practice installing the camera into the Hubble Space Telescope High Fidelity Mechanical Simulator, as well as the carrier systems that will transport the camera to orbit on board the space shuttle. The Wide Field Camera 3 will be Hubble's most advanced camera, increasing its discovery efficiency by a factor of five. The Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, a point source ultraviolet spectrograph, is ready for flight. Astronauts practice installing costs into the high fidelity mechanical simulator and the carrier systems. At Goddard, engineers and astronauts work together developing tools and techniques to resurrect two malfunctioning science instruments currently on orbit inside Hubble. Both the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph and the Advanced Camera for Surveys suffered power supply failures. This is the first time a repair like this has ever been done on orbit. One of NASA's premier training facilities at the Johnson Space Center in Houston is the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. In this 6.2 million gallon swimming pool, Goddard engineers work alongside the astronauts as they train for the mission. Scientists and engineers are excited about flying this last servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope, and we'll update you periodically as preparations continue. My team builds a variety of tools, anywhere from power tools to different hand tools that the astronauts will use. The biggest challenge for us in, de in designing and developing tools for astronauts is to make it easy for them to use in their suit, and especially with their gloved hands that fatigue easily when they're working on orbit. Our team is called the Crew Aids and Tools. It's not all just tools. We also build different things that aid the astronauts in doing the task. We build all the handling aids for any of the instruments or to transport the, um, or use or the orbital replacement units when they're doing the change outs. EVA time is at a premium. So at any tool that we develop, we develop it in order to optimize the time that we have up there and make it as easy and simple for the astronauts to use. We develop tools for HST. Um, one could think you'd go to the hardware store and actually pick out a tool and use that and just deliver it uh, with the astronaut to use in space. The space environment is very harsh. It's very hot, very cold, and it's also in a vacuum. And most tools, power tools, for example, that you pick up from Home Depot, just would not survive in the environment of space. The repair task for this, this one instrument that's about the size of a refrigerator, it's, we call it STIS, but STIS is an acronym for Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. And that, that task is uh, a little bit different than what we normally do. Uh, in this case with STIS, we don't have a replacement module for it. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to replace a card that has failed inside of the box. To actually open up an instrument and pull a board had never been thought of nor conceived that we would want to do that. And therefore the interfaces were not very friendly to an astronaut. In fact, there's 110 of these very small screws that we need to remove from the instrument in order to gain access to the board we need to replace. The beauty of the fastener capture plate is it does capture all the fasteners, but it's got a clear window. And that clear window enables the astronaut, when he takes that power tool, he can actually see the little tiny bit going into the little tiny fastener. So we have not blocked any of his visibility Yet when he takes that fastener out, it won't come out the little hole that the tool passed through. I like all the tools, but the one that I'll probably be using the most is this mini power tool. I'm looking forward to using that. Uh, it's a little, a little drill that uh, 
that is a unique tool that I think is going to be used in space for a long time. So I'm very glad we're going to be the first ones to use it. And I bet you're going to see a lot of space crews using them for many years on new spaceships. It's going to be a pretty cool tool. We work with uh, the engineers here at Goddard on a daily basis. When we're down here, we get to work with them directly. They also come to Houston a lot and work with us, particularly when we're getting ready for our training runs in the, in the pool. I am one of about 20 engineers that scuba dive for the HST telescope program. And we travel down to JSC where we work with the astronaut crew. We develop tools, procedures, and we actually assist in the training of the crew members to perform agency service and tasks. Since I am very um, deeply associated with development of the tools, taking me to that work site alongside the astronaut and see how they interface with the work site and how they use a specific tool or how they see it or operate it. All these different factors are very important things that I need to see that I would not get from just looking at a piece of paper or just a normal conversation about how the task would, would occur. Well, it's really cool diving in MBL. This tank is 6.2 million gallons. It's about 85 degrees. The entire pool is 40 feet deep. That's just one big deep end. But when you're scuba diving, just like you were an astronaut floating around the cargo bay, you do get the sense that you are flying, if you will, just because the water is so clear, and that's a really terrific experience. The stock is the Space Telescope Operations Control Center. And in the stock is where we control Hubble. We control it on a day-to-day -day basis. So all the activities we do, the pointing the telescope at the different targets, the different stars, the different galaxies, getting the data back down, sending commands out to tell it where to point, moving it, oriented in different positions, all that originates in the stock. We have a crew that's there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, controlling the telescope. In normal day-to-day -day operations, we don't perform the science activities here. We're really running the telescope. The scientists are up at the Science Institute in Baltimore, so the data is going to come back down through us and then get sent up to the scientists in Baltimore, and then they're going to decode the data and understand what those pictures mean. It's a, a different operational atmosphere for a servicing mission versus nominal operations. For a regular day-to-day, -day, we only have about three or so people really watching the telescope. And telescopes are built very robustly. If they have a problem, they take care of themselves, they put themselves in a safe state, and you go back and you isolate the problem and fix to see what happened later on. The difference is during a servicing mission, the astronauts can only be out for six hours roughly at a time, and that's because of a limit on how much oxygen and water they carry on board. So if a problem occurs, we don't have the luxury of talking about it and debating what the right course of action is. We have to take action right away. So we have a team of experts who are on console. Somebody's watching the power, somebody's watching the communications, somebody's watching how the telescope will point, and if they see a problem in one of those subsystems, they alert the rest of the team, and we have to quickly diagnose that problem and come up with a resolution because the astronauts, they can't stand around. If they're standing around, and something's not going to get done. So after we get released from the shuttle, we're going to go through a series of commissioning exercises to make sure each of these cameras is working correctly, each of these instruments. So we're going to test them out over a series of months to make sure that the picture that we hope to get is really there. And just like learning how to use any new camera, you have to play with a little bit to try to get the exact focus, exact orientation so it's working correctly. So it really takes about four to five months after we release from the shuttle before the telescope is completely back and working and operational again. 